There was a feud going on in the church between the pastor and the choir director, and it was getting pretty heated. And one week, the preacher preached on commitment and how the congregation should dedicate themselves to service. And the director then led the choir in singing, I shall not be moved. <laughs> the next Sunday, the preacher preached on giving and how they should gladly tithe to the work of the Lord. And the choir director then led the song, Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> See, if you're a Baptist, you really get these songs. Okay? You remember that? The next Sunday, the preacher preached on gossiping and how they should all watch our tongues. We should all watch our tongues. And the hymn was, I love to tell the story. <laughs> the preacher became disgusted over the situation. And the next Sunday, he told the congregation he was thinking of resigning. And the choir then sang, oh, why not tonight? <laughs> when the preacher resigned the next week, he told the church that Jesus had led him there and Jesus was taking him away. And the choir then sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> this is, yeah. This is definitely not what I'm talking about here in terms of direct communication. Ah, so for those of you that have been here over the last few weeks, um, I've been really excited to share with you a book that's near and dear to my heart. It's the most powerful communication tool and the most powerful class I took in ministerial school called Nonviolent Communication. And the book is called Nonviolent Communication, The Language of Life by Marshall Rosenberg. And we are also in the midst of our season for peace and nonviolence. And it just seemed like the perfect thing for us to bring forward right now, especially what's going on in our world. And Jesus also said, blessed are the peacemakers. And this tool is absolutely to create more peace in our world. It's a beautiful way to communicate and resolve conflict. Have con and have a conversation that we might label as difficult. And we can do it. Seeing the other person, hearing the other person, giving from our heart. It's a way for us to stay connected. And one of the things I'm really clear about and, and know about is gossip. It eliminates the need for gossip. It supports going direct. And sometimes we go, well, what is gossip? Gossip is when someone has hurt you or made a decision or something that you don't quite understand and instead of going directly to that person and asking them about it and having a conversation about it, you go to someone else. And it's called triangling. And that is one of the most detrimental practices in relationship that we can do, folks, especially in community and with each other. So nonviolent communication supports us in taking responsibility for our experience our ability, my ability to respond. It helps us to respond consciously, to be the expression of love and compassion and authenticity that creates relationships that are loving, compassionate, and authentic. It's a tool to help us communicate what is alive in us with empathy and honesty. We're considering the feelings and needs of not only us but others. And remember last week, we talked about the cause of our feelings is never about other people's behaviors. The cause of our feelings is never about other people's behaviors. What another person does is the stimulus for what you feel, but not the cause of your feelings. You know, you made me feel. No. What that's tapping into is an unrecognized need. Did you know that underneath judgments, criticisms, interpretations, and the way we diagnose each other, there's an unrecognized need? If someone comes up to you and says, you're not listening to me, what they're really expressing is their need to be heard. It's not being fulfilled for them. Or, you work all the time and don't have time for us to do things together. The need underneath that expression is, 
probably connection or intimacy. So the tricky part about expressing our needs indirectly like this is that the person hears them as a criticism, as a judgment. And then what happens then when you're trying to communicate what's not working for you, but if you do it indirectly in that way, as they hear it as a criticism or judgment, all the energy that they could invest in connecting with you, they begin start investing it in protection and defending and counterattacking. Have you ever experienced that? Okay. Yeah, if we want someone to communicate, if we want to connect with someone, we need to express our needs and our feelings directly instead of covertly. But it can be scary, can it? Because we don't know how it's going to be received. So talk about something that wasn't taught to me in school. I didn't learn what a real feeling is, much less what a need is. You know, and often when we express our needs, we get concerned, well, I'm going to show up needy. But many of us were raised to feel we were responsible for the needs of others, for the feelings of others. Anybody else relate to that? As a result, we make other people wrong for not meeting our needs because they're just supposed to know what they are. Right? If he loved me, he'd know that I want him to massage my feet. I said they were hurting. He's ignoring me. If she knew me, she would know that I think about her all the time and that I love her. I wish she wouldn't be so sensitive and demanding. My teenager is so lazy. Doesn't he know the laundry goes in the laundry basket and not on the floor? Jeez. How's that kind of communication working for us? Yeah. Marshall Rosenberg was an amazing, amazing mediator, and he did mediation work with all kinds of groups, gangs and law enforcement, uh, between landowners and migrant farm workers, between Israelis and Palestinians. And what he noticed is that the skill that everyone seemed to have down pat was the ability to make each other wrong. Instead of being able to clearly express their own needs. And this is what he said. He said, it's been my experience over and over again that from the moment people began talking about what they need rather than what's wrong with one another, the possibility of finding ways to meet everyone's needs is greatly increased. So what is a need, though? I didn't grow up with that dictionary. There are some examples of basic human needs we all share. Autonomy. The ability to choose our dreams, our goals, our values, and how to fulfill them. Celebration. To celebrate the creation of life and fulfill dreams and to acknowledge the loss of loved ones, to mourn. It's a need. Integrity. And that includes authenticity, creativity, self-worth, and meaning. Interdependence, which includes acceptance, appreciation, connection, emotional safety, love, respect, empathy, trust, spiritual communion, beauty, harmony, order, and peace. We have a need for play, for fun and laughter, for physical nurturance, like air, food, rest, shelter, water, touch, protection. You know, Marshall Rosenberg talks about the experience of emotional liberation. And what that means is when we are emotionally liberated, it means that we know that our feelings are something that we have. They don't have us. And we know that when we have a feeling that underneath that feeling is a need. So in order for us to experience emotional liberation, we get to respond to the needs of others with compassion, never out of guilt or fear or shame, because we take responsibility for our feelings, our actions, and our intentions, but not the feelings and actions and intentions of others. 
See, the truth is we can never meet our own needs at the expense of another person. And when we're experiencing emotional liberation, we state clearly what we need in a way that lets the other person know that we are equally concerned about their needs being met. We have empathy. That's what nonviolent communication is all about. Okay, so we have a need. And so then, I'm moving through the steps of nonviolent communication, and I'm going to review those with you. In just a moment. In order to have our needs met and have our lives enriched, we need to learn how to make a request. And a request is asking for actions that might fulfill our needs. And we get to do it in positive language. Okay, I'm going to go back to that scenario about the massaging feet thing. Okay. If he loved me, he'd know that I want him to massage my feet. I said they were hurting, he's ignoring me. Okay, sometimes we might start out by saying to our partner, don't ignore me. Okay, when you hear that, do you feel inspired to massage that person's feet? (laughs) And plus that, it doesn't communicate. Don't ignore me. How is this person's partner supposed to understand that by me saying don't ignore me, that means I want you to massage my feet? (laughs) They don't know. It's important to make requests in clear, positive, concrete action language so the person knows exactly what's being requested of them. There's no ambiguity. So the woman might say, Honey, my feet are hurting. In the South, we say, My dogs are barking. I would feel so grateful if you would massage my feet. You know, I have to, I, I, I need to be, my feet need to be in good shape because I'm going to stand all day the next day. And it would just be so nice. It would, I would feel so grateful if you would massage my feet. Would you massage my feet? Yes, honey. <laughs> yeah. Instead of saying, have you ever heard, honey, my feet sure do hurt. Wow, I feel so good if someone would massage them. Yeah, I think you get the point. Or, Dad, come and honey, massage my feet. That's a demand. There's a difference between a request and a demand because you know something is a demand by the way the speaker of the request, how they show up if it's not met. If they judge, if they criticize, if they lay a guilt trip on you, it's a demand. So when someone meets a request, it's always so nice to express appreciation. Okay, so let's review the four steps of nonviolent communication. The first step is someone does something to hurt you and you want to clear it up with them because you're not going to go talk about it in the parking lot, right? So you go to the person directly, and you say exactly what you observed without interpretation. Step one. The next step is you express your feelings authentically. Step three. You recognize and take responsibility for your feelings and know that the feelings that you're feeling are because there's a need not being met. You express that need. And finally, number four, you make a request. It's so simple, isn't it? It might sound simple, but it's not always. But I tell you, if you take on this practice, it lays the foundation for creating relationships that are so much more loving, so much more authentic. So, this week, you want to take this on? Will you take this on? (laughs) All right. I just invite you this week, if you choose to, to explore. Look at your feelings. Look at what you're feeling about something. 
You know, even when you look at something on Facebook, something turns you, or you're in relationship with someone, you have a feeling. And it might be unsettling to you. I invite you to explore a little deeper. What's the need? First of all, get in touch with what the feeling really is. Remember, there's a difference between a feeling and a thought and an opinion. What are you feeling? What's the need underneath that? Because remember, just because you have a need does not make you needy. You are a human being, and you have needs. Practice making a request to someone coming from an awareness of the need that is being made by that request. And please appreciate them when they attempt to meet that need, that request. And there's some nonviolent communication books in the bookstore. <laughs> and I really invite you to see if it resonates for you, see if you, it's a practice that you would like to integrate on your spiritual journey. So let's take a deep breath. Thank you for your willingness to receive these teachings. And I bless you as you practice them. Let's affirm together. As I express my needs and make requests nonviolently, I create relationships based in honesty and empathy. And so it is. Bless you.